What's up designers and welcome back to Remton Games. I love video games, and if you're watching this video, you probably do too. Video games are such a rich, powerful medium of entertainment that can accomplish things that are impossible in any other medium. I believe that everyone should have the opportunity to explore the far reaches of Hyrule, steal hearts as a phantom thief, and even rekindle the first flame. However, this is often not possible, as games are often not designed with everyone in mind. They may be lacking necessary accessibility options, or have features that make them difficult or impossible to play for some players. Luckily, it doesn't have to be this way. In this video, I'm going to be taking a look at how you can make your games more accessible and open up these virtual experiences to the widest possible audience. We'll start by taking a look at the importance and benefits of making games more accessible, then we'll take a look at how you can make games more accessible for various different types of players, including players who are blind or have low vision, players who are deaf or hard of hearing, players who have limited mobility or dexterity, players with cognitive disabilities, and those who have seizure disorders or motion sickness. Without further ado, let's get started. I believe that making games more accessible is a worthy goal for its own sake, and if you already agree, then you can go ahead and skip to the next section. However, I know that for many people this can be a bit of a hard sell. After all, implementing accessibility features into a game isn't free, and it can require putting extra time and money into a feature that seems to provide a small benefit. In this section, I want to show why this benefit is actually much larger than it may seem at first, and why making your game more accessible can benefit both the game itself and your company's bottom line. There is a common misconception that people with disabilities make up such a small percentage of the population that it's not really worth designing your game around them. However, according to the CDC, about 1 in 4 adult Americans has some form of disability. 1 in 4. That's tens of millions of potential customers that won't be able to play your game if it isn't designed to be accessible for them. While it will take some extra time and money to make your game accessible to those players, it'll almost certainly be a lot less than 25% of your game's total budget, which means you're getting a great return on your investment. In addition, many of the most important accessibility features are a lot easier to implement than you might think. In many cases, it's simply a case of making your game more customizable, whether that be adjusting the size of text or allowing for remapping of controls. If you're doing your job as a developer, then all of these things should be easily adjustable independent variables anyways, so allowing the player to adjust those values should be trivial. If anything, making your game customizable for the sake of promoting accessibility is simply enforcing good programming practices. In many cases, this also promotes good game design practices. Many accessible features, such as adding unique sounds to in-game actions or pausing the game when there's on-screen text, are simply good game design that make the game better for everyone. Speaking of making games better for everyone, there's a concept in accessible design known as the curb cut effect, which is named after the sloping sections on the edges of sidewalks that allow them to smoothly transition to the street. These curb cuts were originally designed to make sidewalks more accessible for people in wheelchairs, but ended up having a whole host of additional side effects. These include making it easier for people who are pushing strollers or shopping carts to get up onto the curbs, helping elderly people with walkers, making it easier for people who are riding bikes or carrying luggage behind them, and so on. Digital accessibility features can work in the same way. They may be intended to help one specific group of players, but they can end up benefiting other players in unexpected ways. Finally. One thing that we all have in common is that we're all getting older at a rate of 60 minutes per hour. Gone are the days when gaming was considered a hobby for kids, and I for one plan to die with a controller in my hand, or whatever kind of futuristic input devices they have 80 years from now. However, aging is associated with a loss of vision or hearing, lower dexterity and mobility, and other age-related disabilities that can make gaming more difficult. 
Today, around 6% of the gaming population is age 65 or over, but that percentage is only going to grow over time. Accessibility features help ensure that gamers who may not have a disability now will still be able to play their favorite games in the future if they do develop one, whether through age or through unforeseen circumstances such as an accident or disease. With there being so many benefits to adding accessibility features to your game, you'd have to be a fool not to make your game more accessible. However, even if you want to make an accessible game, it can still seem pretty daunting. Never fear, in the next few sections of the video I'm going to be going over ways to make your game more accessible to players with various different types of accessibility needs, starting with players who are blind. Video games are traditionally a very visual medium. I mean, it has video right in the title. So designing games for players who have little to no vision can seem a bit daunting. However, it can be done, just takes a little bit of extra work. The key here is to make sure that information is not conveyed only visually, but using an additional sense, such as sound or controller vibration. One simple way to do this is through text-to-speech technology. Screen reader off enables narration of on-screen text. This is not only helpful for navigating menus, but can also be used for text boxes if your game doesn't have dialogue, in-world text such as signs, or for reading notes or books that the character might encounter. Born in a Spark Laboratory, the Keen Twins were considered a failed experiment. Besides text, you should also provide audio cues for other important aspects of your game. For example, if your game features enemies that the player must avoid or fight, there can be audio cues to help them know where the enemies are. Keep in mind that these cues can be as simple as an enemy's footsteps or a monster's growls that use spatial audio techniques to indicate distance and direction. If you're making a fighting game, in addition to making unique animations for every attack, you can also assign each attack a unique sound effect. In fact, many fighting games already do this without even necessarily thinking about accessibility, which is why games like Mortal Kombat and Street Fighter have entire communities of players who are blind. One of the most morbidly satisfying things to do in a fighting game is to demolish someone completely and utterly, to then inform them that they were just defeated by a blind opponent. Madden is also very popular among players who are blind because it has built-in commentary about what is happening on the virtual field, along with various rumble cues to indicate the state of the game. Here's second and ten. Burrow going to give this to Mixon. And he stopped right at the 25 after a gain of five. If your game has cutscenes, you can also take a page out of Hollywood's book and include audio descriptions of your cutscenes. An audio description is an additional track of audio that describes the important visual aspects of the scene, so that a player who's blind can get a more complete understanding of what is happening during the scene. She sits back beside him as he opens the box to reveal a gray wristwatch with a leather strap. You kept complaining about your broken watch. Finally, if your game includes characters who communicate visually, such as by using sign language, you should provide an option to turn on spoken translations of the signs or gestures. It's messing You're with Harlem? out of a shipping center near the river and follow them. Low vision is a very broad category. Depending on how severe the loss of vision is, some players with low vision may depend on the same accessibility features that are useful for blind players. For others, however, it's still possible for them to perceive information presented visually, they just might need a bit of extra help. One way to make visual cues more accessible to players with low vision is to simply increase the size of those visual cues. This option can apply to things like adjusting the size of in-game text, or adjusting aspects of the heads-up display. You could also provide a magnification mode option, which allows a player to zoom into specific parts of the screen to get a better look. Another option is to make the visual information more obvious by increasing the contrast, adding outlines or highlights around important elements, 
or replacing difficult to read text with a more legible font. Another way to make the important parts of your game more visible are by adding options to reduce visual clutter or obfuscating effects. This might include things like turning off camera shake, disabling lens effects such as raindrops on the camera when it's raining or blood on the camera when you take damage, or even reducing the number of distracting particle effects. However, keep in mind that making things more visible isn't always the best solution. Players who have eye strain might actually require options to decrease the contrast, and players with light sensitivity might require the ability to reduce the brightness, invert the colors, or activate a dark mode. Color blindness is extremely common. It's estimated that between 7 and 10% of men are born colorblind, although it's much less common for women. Conveying information through color is shockingly common in video games, and doing so can make it difficult for players with colorblindness to navigate and interact with the world of the game. The easiest way to design for players with colorblindness is to make sure that color is not the only indicator of important information. For example, suppose you're playing a team-based game where players on your team have a blue name tag and players on the opposing team have a red name tag. Players with colorblindness may not be able to distinguish which other players are on their own team. However, if you also put a symbol next to the name of each player indicating whether they're a friend or a foe, then a player could use this symbol rather than the color to perceive this information. If color is used to present important information, another possible solution is to allow the player to choose which colors they want to use. For example, you can include a setting that let the player determine the colors for friendly and enemy characters so they could choose colors that are easily distinguishable to them. If you want to take it a step further, the game can provide a colorblind mode that includes several different filters that can adjust the in-game colors. Keep in mind that there are many different types of colorblindness, so these color adjustment settings should provide different filters to handle these different types, or even better, allow a range of color settings that the players can adjust themselves. In the same way that we translate visual information into another form to help players with impaired vision, a primary strategy for promoting accessibility for players who are deaf or hard of hearing is to translate audio information into another form, such as on-screen text or controller vibrations. The simplest and most common example of this is subtitles. Most games these days provide the option to turn on subtitles for dialogue, which is a great first step, but simply providing subtitles isn't always enough. In order for your subtitles to be truly accessible, they need to be clearly readable. If the subtitles are in a difficult to read font or don't have enough contrast with the background, then they might not be serving their purpose. To support readability, subtitles should have options to adjust the size of the font, add a background behind the words to enhance the contrast, and possibly even options to change the color or typeface. The actual words that are being spoken aren't the only pieces of information that might not be accessible to a player who is deaf or hard of hearing. In addition to dialogue, games should include the option to indicate who is speaking and include captions for non-dialogue background sounds such as rumbling thunder, gunshots, doors slamming shut, and so on. While subtitles can be great for dialogue, other forms of audio information may require specific options to make them more accessible. I mentioned earlier that you can use sounds such as growls or footsteps to indicate the location of enemies. However, if the game lets you hear an approaching enemy long before you see the enemy, players who are deaf or hard of hearing might be at a disadvantage. One way to get around this is to have an option for visual indicators, such as on-screen arrows, that indicate the locations of nearby enemies. Another mechanic that may not be accessible to some players are stealth mechanics, specifically those that rely on moving silently to avoid being noticed. Because these players may be unable to tell when their characters are making sound, and therefore revealing their location, you could have a sound level indicator on screen that shows how much sound you're making, with indications to keep the sound below a particular threshold. 
Another option to support players who are hard of hearing is to have individual volume adjustments for different audio tracks, such as dialogue, music, and background noise. This can allow the player to focus more clearly on the sounds that are important to them. In a similar vein, you could also provide an enhanced speech mode or similar option, which would make the dialogue in your game more intelligible by boosting frequencies that are common in speech while reducing other frequencies. Players with low mobility or dexterity may have the ability to perceive and understand everything that's going on in the game, but might have difficulty physically interacting with the game, at least using the standard controls. One key way to support these players is to allow them to use whatever input method they're most comfortable with. For some players, this may mean using the standard controllers, but with non-standard button bindings. To support this, you should always allow players to fully remap the controls of the game to fit their needs. This remapping should apply to all aspects of the game, including accessing and navigating menus. And if your game has multiple distinct modes of play, such as in-combat and out-of-combat phases of many RPGs, you should be able to adjust the controls for each mode separately. Some players may not be able to use the default controllers at all, and will require an alternative form of input. You should strive to support as many input devices as possible, and allowing full remapping of controls makes it much easier to use and configure accessible controllers. Other helpful controller-related settings include adjustable sensitivity controls for mice and joysticks, and the ability to invert the horizontal and vertical axes. Even with these adjustments, however, it may not be possible for some players to press inputs as quickly or precisely as a player without limited dexterity. There are certain mechanics that can provide a particular challenge for these players, and the game should provide the option of turning off these mechanics or providing an alternative, more accessible form of input. One example of an inaccessible mechanic is quick time events, which require the player to press specific buttons in a particular sequence, usually with a short timer. Another example are mechanics that require the player to rapidly and repeatedly tap the same button over and over, or alternate back and forth between two buttons, or even holding down a single button for a long period of time. These types of mechanics may be extremely difficult, tiring, or even impossible for some players, so you should provide options to turn off these mechanics or replace them with more accessible forms. For example, many PC games require holding down the shift button to crouch or sprint. Rather than requiring the button to be held, you could allow an option where simply pressing the button once toggles the state, and that state remains until the player chooses to press the button again. There are a few more quick ways you can make your controls more accessible. First, if your game uses motion or gesture controls, you should make sure those aren't the only options and that there are alternative ways of controlling the game. Finally, controller vibrations can make it more difficult for some players to use a controller, or even cause them to drop it. Because of this, you should include options to adjust the strength of the vibration, or at least the ability to turn it on and off. Finally, long boss battles, difficult platforming challenges, and other mechanics that require quick reflexes or precise inputs can be an accessibility barrier that prevents many players from being able to experience the game, including many players without disabilities. Difficulty settings are a large enough topic that they could easily be their own video, but in short, I believe that pretty much any game could benefit from the addition of difficulty settings, and no game has ever suffered from them. Ideally, there should be a range of difficulty adjustments, and the player should be able to change them at any time, not just at the beginning of the game. However, this may not be necessary if your game employs a dynamic difficulty adjustment system that automatically adjusts the difficulty to suit the player. Cognitive disabilities are another very broad category that can include anything from difficulties with learning and attention, to problems with memory, spatial awareness, and more. Players with memory difficulties may have difficulty remembering where they're supposed to go or what they're supposed to do in a game, 
So this important information should always be available at any time, either on screen via a heads up display or in an easily accessible in-game pause menu. Types of information that should be accessible this way include current quests and objectives, controls, player stats, and so on. The player should also be able to replay tutorials at any time, and ideally would have the option to re-watch cutscenes or see a transcript of recent dialogue. Some players may have difficulties with spatial reasoning, which makes it more difficult for them to navigate the in-game world, especially in a massive open world game with no clear path or indication of where to go next. To help these players, you should provide options for navigational aids, such as a glowing path to the next objective, or an arrow that points you in the right direction. On a similar note, it's not always obvious which aspects of the world can be interacted with, which can exacerbate difficulties navigating. To address this, you might want to include an option to make interactable objects more obvious, such as by adding an outline or glow effect. Other players may have difficulty reading or understanding text, and there are many ways to address this issue. First and foremost, the game should pause when presenting text to the player to allow them time to read it. Some players may take more time than others, and they shouldn't be punished with enemies appearing out of nowhere to attack them, for example. Other options, such as adding voiceover or speech to text for the text, or allowing the player to adjust the size, color, or font of the text may also be helpful. With a stomp of her foot, she can send shockwaves rippling through the ground. On a quick side note, some sources I've seen suggest allowing an option for players to select a dyslexia-friendly font to make the game more accessible to players with dyslexia. However, the research that I've seen suggests that these dyslexia-friendly fonts don't actually improve reading speed or comprehension, and when given the choice, players tend to prefer standard fonts such as Times New Roman or Arial. There is some evidence, however, that increasing line and letter spacing can have an effect on reading speed and comprehension, so that's an adjustment that may be worth offering. In another example of how a single accessibility setting can affect multiple different groups of players in different ways, having the option to reduce noise, both auditory and visual, can help players with certain cognitive disabilities better understand what's going on in the game by reducing unnecessary information to allow them to better focus on what's most important. This can be accomplished by providing separate volume sliders for different audio tracks, as well as letting players turn off visual effects such as camera shake and particle effects. You could also give players the option to customize their heads up display so that they can remove on-screen stats and icons that are less important to them and focus on the most relevant pieces of information. Finally, the previously mentioned option to highlight or outline objects that can be interacted with may also help these players. The final category of players we'll be looking at today are those who can become sick by playing video games, those with seizure disorders and motion sickness. One thing to be very aware of when designing your game is that certain patterns of light and color can be triggers for seizures in some players. The first thing you may think of is a rapidly flashing light, such as a strobe light, but it doesn't have to be that extreme. Rapid alternation of contrasting colors can also be a trigger, as can something as simple as light being intermittently blocked by obstacles. Think about the sunlight that passes between fence posts or between the branches of trees as you drive by. That could be a potential trigger. The rule of thumb is that a pattern can be a potential trigger if it flashes or alternates more than twice a second. If your game includes these types of patterns, you should at the very least have an obvious warning about the presence of these triggers, and if possible, you should have the option to turn off these effects or skip them. Another illness that can be triggered by video games is motion sickness. This is most commonly triggered by first-person cameras, but it can also be caused by third-person games as well. Unfortunately, there's no known way to completely prevent video game-induced motion sickness, but there are many ways to mitigate it. Certain camera effects, including camera shake, head bob, motion blur, and depth of field, are more likely to trigger motion sickness, so your game should include options to turn off these camera effects. 
You may also want the option to switch between first and third person camera perspectives. Higher frame rates tend to be associated with less motion sickness, so some games provide the option to increase the frame rate at the expense of details such as ray tracing or HDR. Finally, there is evidence that having a stationary point on screen, such as a crosshair or even just a small dot in the middle of the screen, can provide a visual anchor that reduces the effects of motion sickness. Video game accessibility has improved so much over the last few years, but we still have a long way to go to make video games as accessible as possible to all players. I hope that this video has helped you understand the importance of accessible design in video games, and how you can make your own games more accessible. If you enjoyed this video, make sure to give it a like and subscribe so you don't miss more of my videos in the future. You should also check out the rest of the channel. I've got dozens of videos on all kinds of game design topics, and even more over on the Remton Games blog. And join me next time for the ultimate guide to homebrewing subclasses in D&D 5th edition. Until then, thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you all next time.